I want to share a word that impacted me when I found it maybe two, three weeks ago. Um, I haven't been praying it daily, but that's where I, I want to go. Um, the challenge is I keep thinking, oh, so so needs to hear this, so I take it down and put it on the office desk so I can mail it off to some of my clients, not all of my clients, just a few that, you know, the hand of God is on for um, sacrificial and worshipful living. So this came out of Chuck Pierce's Facebook. And um, it, when I read it, it just... So um, if you want a copy, let me know and I'll email it to you. This is what it says. The time has begun. You feel the start, the beginning. The soberness of what will happen next is in you this morning. It is now all business. Make all of your plans accordingly. You must be where I need you at all times. Let me guide you and let me direct you. Stay in my spirit. Wait for me to speak. All else must fall to the wayside. I will take care of the fallout. This is a time of such focus. This is a time to heed everything I speak to you. Take nothing lightly, nothing. Walk in obedience. Walk in my leading. Nothing else matters now. Listen for every nuance of my voice, every urge in your spirit. For surely I'm speaking with my people now. Approach each day ready to hear what is on my heart. Wait for every word I speak that you might walk in tandem with me. Place your hand firmly in mine and do not fear. We will walk this together and all will be well as we do. Challenging at times, yes, but it will be well with you as you look to me for everything. This is not a time to hesitate or a time to doubt. This is not a time to move ahead of me. This is a time to wait, to listen, and to move when I say move. I will make it clear as you settle yourself before me and listen. Don't be afraid to ask, don't be afraid to hear what I ask of you. Don't dread to hear. What I ask, I will give grace for. Fear has no place in what we will do together in days ahead. Don't listen to his voice. Don't let him speak to you. He is trying to, and he will try. Greater am I than he, and he has no power unless you give it to him. Don't. Victory is ahead. It will come. Keep your focus on that when you don't see it right away. It will come. Victory will come. And I think it was three or four weeks ago that Mike said that we were established in the victory in Christ. So from the words that have come forth today, we can see that God has been building week upon week. I think it was maybe a month ago that Avi from Singapore um, had a vision of a horse in a stable being let out. Today the horse is in the, in the house. So um, every, every prophecy that we've been getting week upon week has been building one upon the other. And um, we need to be able to discern. We need to be able to just obey. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. It's so simple. So simple. It's not about how many times we say I love you. It's not even really about the depth of our worship. It is about our obedience. So let me just share before I start the word. I want to share a testimony from somebody who was obedient. Just obedient. Had no idea that God was doing anything. Right? Just did what he felt the Lord was telling him to do. And had no idea that uh, God was doing anything behind the scenes. Most of you might have heard of Tim Tebow, the US professional footballer. He's a Christian. He uh, takes a lot, of stuff, a lot of attack for being a Christian, but he is stalwart in his faith. And you know, in American football, I don't know much about it, but they have the, the black under the eyes. Well, he has on his Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through, not he doesn't have all the wording, but he has Philippians 4, 13. But he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. And they had one every, I forget how many years ago this was, but 
but they had won every game and now they were in the Nationals. In the Super Bowl, I think, is that the Nationals? So um, they're in the Nationals. And his coach likes things kept in order. So if you win the first game of your season wearing black socks, the next week everybody's still wearing black socks, but they're higher or bigger or thicker or something. Like, you know, black work this time, then black socks will work this time, but we just need to make it a bit, you know. So he was dreading telling his coach that he wanted to um, change the scripture. Because he knew his coach would say, no, this has worked for us all this time and brought us to where we are. You can't change it now. But anyway, he went to his coach and he just said, look, I just really feel if I don't do this, I'm going to be disobedient. And the Lord is asking me to put John 3.16. Oh. And the coach thought about it and then he said, okay. Like, not happy about it, but, but if you feel that's God, okay. Well, they won the Nationals. But do you know what happened? 94 million people Googled John 3.16. Straight after the game or during the game. 94 million. So his response was, I can't believe that many people don't know John 3.16. That, that was what he thought. But 94 people Googled John 3.16. So he had no idea God was doing anything. But God was at work. Three years later, to the day, there's another football game. And he's still got John 3.16. And they won. So he's heading off to do the media um, interview thing. And he's the PR guy for the whole team stops him and says, Tim, do you know what happened? And he went, yeah, 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 we won. You know, like, I've got to go and speak to the media. He says, no, 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 no. Do you know what happened? And he went, look, I've got to go. No, he said, no, you need to know what happened. And he said, well, what happened? And he said, three years ago to this day, you changed that under your eye to John 3.16. Today, three years after today, you threw the 316 yards. Um, your yards per rush, whatever that means, but your yards per rush were 3.16, yards per completion, 31.6, Time of possession, 31.6. Um, ratings, 31.6. And 90 million people Googled John 3.16. It was the number one thing on social media. And Tim said, God, I didn't know you were doing anything. So sometimes we can look at our lives and think, God's really not doing much. I'm not making much of an impact on anybody. I really can't see when God's breathing. I really can't see who's being touched. But behind the scenes, God is doing so much more, impacting people because you are the living epistle of Christ, because you are what they see, because Jesus is not walking this earth, you are, because you are the image bearer, because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, because you are intoxicated by the Spirit of God, that you come under the influence of a Holy Spirit, because you are that living epistle. So everywhere you go, people, looking at you and they're reading you like they would be reading the Bible and you are having an impact on people that you know nothing about but you're going to find out when you go home. Do not despise. You know, don't look at yourself and think, oh, I don't know what God's doing. Don't do that. God uses each and every one of us. Each and every one of you. His hand is on your life for good. You are all called. You've all got different assignments. You've all got different gifts and talents and abilities. But you are all called. You are all the temple of the Holy Spirit. So one of the things that I want to talk about today, Father, I pray that you would give me oh, the tongue of a ready writer, that Father God would be the, the tongue of a disciple, that I would hear from you, that I would speak what you want spoken, that Father, hearts would be impacted, that Father, um, obstructions to the Holy Spirit would be busted down in the name of Jesus, that there would be a freedom to flow with the Holy Spirit in our personal lives that we've never had before, that the limitations that we place
place upon ourselves would be completely destroyed and that we would come into a freedom that comes as we flow with the Holy Spirit, spirit to spirit with God, as we flow cardiognosis, heart to heart with God, as we know Him by heart. And so we speak right now that as this word comes forth, let it come forth anointed, let it come forth in fire, let it come forth ministered by the angels of God, and let it come forth and change. Because we are to be temples of the Holy Spirit, living under a divine influence that makes you intoxicated with the joy of living. So sometimes we have to tell our faces, I'm actually enjoying myself. Sometimes the people around us aren't too sure. So I just want to... Talk about the first miracle of Jesus. If you want to turn to John chapter 2. Oh, this is this is Ooh. a wild goose Ooh. chase. Oh, this is a wild goose chase. And Jenny sent Jenny sent this through. I think this is after Wednesday night, the wild goose. I love the wild goose. Let me just see. from Nat Johnson, Nate Johnson today on um, social media. The thing about pioneering, and that's what we are here, pioneers, apostolic pioneers with a prophetic bent. The thing about pioneering is that when you're actually pioneering, it never feels like it. Instead, it feels like you're wasting, floundering, wandering, and on a wild goose chase. But I heard the Lord say today that the wild goose chase is following the ark, following the presence of the Lord. So don't give up or mistake these seasons as a waste or foolish endeavor. The wrestle is on it because the enemy wants you feeling ridiculous so you go back to the safe and sterile path. So pioneers today, surrender to the wild goose chase because you're following the cloud by day and the fire by night. We are on a wild goose chase. So in John chapter 1, I love the book of John. Oh my gosh. You know, they couldn't kill that guy no matter what they did. They tried. They boiled him in oil. They did all sorts of things. They stuck him on an island called Patmos and he writes the book of Revelation. What do you do with a guy like that? What do you do with a guy that you can't kill? Seriously. We need a few of those in Christianity today. A few of those that have poked the enemy for a bit. You can't kill him no matter what you do because his time wasn't up. He was going to go when he was ready to go. And I love that. I absolutely love that. But in the book of John, which is so different to the other Gospels, because they're all about the, the natural side, but John's about the spiritual side. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. In the book of John, in the very first chapter, there are eight titles of God. Eight, sorry, eight titles of Jesus. In the very first chapter of the book of John. Eight titles of our King. They start off John saying, what, do you want to know about Jesus? These are the times. And they're all in the first chapter, eight of them. And they are, because the word, life, light, the sun, the lamb, the Messiah, the king, and the son of man. Starting in verse 1, ending in verse 51. He is the word in verse life, in verse 1. He is the life in verse 4. Jesus is the light in verse 7. Jesus is the Son in verse 8. Jesus is the Lamb in verse 29. Jesus is the Messiah in verse 41. Jesus is the King in verse 49. And Jesus is the Son of Man in verse 51. Jesus. These are the titles of Jesus. John says, you want to know about them? The book of John was written, why? So that you would believe. That's why it was written. It says that in what John 19, John chapter 20. It says this book was written so that you might believe. And so him that's starting off with, these are eight titles of our king. You want to know who he is? Bam! Right in your face. This is who he is. He's the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of Man. He's the Lamb of God. His word, his life, his light. This is who he is. This is so you can believe. And then the very first miracle that he did is in John chapter 2. And I want you to have a think about this. They're at a wedding. What is Jesus coming back for? Where are we heading? We're heading for a wedding, right? Yes. Oh, we're heading for a wedding. Yes. Oh. And so Jesus is at this wedding. And his time had not yet come. Our time has not yet come. Right? 
See the parallels. But they had run out of wine. And sometimes when you look around at the, the, the body of Christ, we seem to have run out of wine. Where's the power of God, we say? Where are the miracles of God, we say? We're almost ashamed because we're not demonstrating the power of God. We're not seeing it demonstrated. We don't have to demonstrate it. But there's almost this kind of like, oh my gosh, what's happened? What's happened? Where's the power and the presence? 